What in a theorist is diminishing returns? Usually it is talked about in context where what it seems to mean is that if you do both X and Y then it's bad. Like with defensive cooldowns. But for a lot of Final Fantasy XIV players what it actually means beyond bad is sort of like a black box. To that end, in this video I will explain what we mean exactly when we talk about diminishing returns and also give some practical examples of how that interacts with other things in the game. Hold on to your hats or glasses, if you have any, because this is going to get mathematical. So there are two primary kinds of diminishing returns that we commonly talk about. One is in regards to defensive cooldowns and the other is in regards to crowd control. This one goes out to the white mages. I will cover both and I will also cover adjacently relevant subjects, which will make sense when they come up. Let's begin with the simpler one to explain, crowd control diminishing returns. Crowd control is effectively anything that can impact the ability for your opponent to act. Stuns, paralysis, slows, heavy, sleep and blind are some key examples of this, with stun being by far the most common among them. Note that effects that reduce the effectiveness of acts by your opponent is not crowd control. This would mean effects that reduce damage done, for example, like reprisal. The way crowd control diminishing returns work is that when you apply such an effect the first time, it will last its full duration as listed. When applied, an additional hidden one minute long effect is also applied to the target, which is the diminishing returns effect. If you reapply the same type of crowd control within that minute, it will only have half of the duration and will add an additional stack, let's say, to the diminishing returns effect and also reset the one minute timer. If you reapply the same type of crowd control again after that, then it will only have a fourth of the original duration and will of course also add one more stack to the diminishing returns, which actually replaces it with a complete immunity to that type of crowd control for one minute. That's the general idea of crowd control diminishing returns. Note that this mechanic is not present in PvP at all. Now, with that, there are a few details to keep in mind about all this. The first detail is that the diminishing returns effect is applied when the crowd control is applied itself. So if you sleep something for 30 seconds and don't break the sleep, then you can actually reapply a new fresh 30 second sleep effect again 30 seconds after the first one ends, because the diminishing returns only lasts a total of 60 seconds. The second detail is that if you ever try to apply a weaker version of the same effect on something, it will usually fail. This means that if you apply a 30 second sleep effect to a target and then attempt to reapply it before the duration drops below 15 seconds, then it will simply fail to connect. And if it fails to connect, then the diminishing returns will also not be refreshed or affected at all in fact. The primary way we interact with this feature of the game directly is through the White Mage spell Holy, which of course stuns for 4 seconds, then 2, then 1. Due to the previously mentioned mechanics and some weird jank that appears to be unique to Holy itself, spamming the spell almost always still leads to a combined 7 second stun, rarely 6 seconds, and sometimes even 8 or 9 seconds somehow. I went over this in the second episode of my Final Fantasy XIV Mythbuster series, link in the description if you're interested. And now we get to the more interesting part, diminishing returns of defensive cooldowns. The key to understanding this subject is multiplicative stacking as opposed to additive stacking. Most buffs in Final Fantasy XIV stack multiplicatively. There are exceptions and I will talk about one of them later in this video. But things stacking multiplicatively is so common that it is safe to assume that as the default in most situations. Multiplicative stacking means A times B, which is usually a good thing if you're trying to produce a bigger number, 3 times 3 is 9, but is bad if you're trying to produce a smaller number, a half times a half is a quarter. Additive stacking means A plus B or a minus B even, which is usually a bad thing if you're trying to produce a bigger number, 3 plus 3 is 6, but is good if you're trying to produce a smaller number, a half minus a half is 0, 
Now, how does this relate to defensive cooldowns? Well, if a Paladin uses Rampart and Sentinel, they both take 20% less damage and 30% less damage. How do these stack? Multiplicatively. This means that you reduce the damage you take by one of them and then the other. So 100% of the damage you take is first reduced by 20%. 100% times 80% equals 80% obviously. Then the remaining 80% is reduced by 30%. 80% times 70% equals 56%, meaning you actually reduce the damage by 44%. Note that the order doesn't matter. This is in stark contrast to how, if they did in fact stack additively, they would reduce the damage to 50%. Had the Paladin also blocked the attack, then typically blocks reduce damage by 20% as well, although this can vary slightly when synced down, or if you're using a weaker shield. But this 20% is simply multiplied onto the other things. 56% times 80% equals 44.8%, and so on. An important reason why these kinds of cooldowns stack multiplicatively is because if they didn't, we could run into a lot of weird inconsistencies in the game, or weird game interactions. The primary of which would be, if defensive cooldowns stacked additively and a paladin used Sentinel, Rampart, Holy Sheltron and Bulwark, then they should take zero damage, right? And if someone else in the party reduced the damage the Paladin takes by another 10%, then the Paladin should be receiving healing instead of taking damage. Right? Another example would be how debuffs like Reprisal would stack with other defensives, but I guess we are getting a bit sidetracked now. What is relevant is that this multiplicative stacking makes other defensive cooldowns more predictable as well. Arm's length increasing the time between attacks by enemies by 20% is equivalent to reducing damage taken by 5 sixths, or 16.666, repeating of course, percent. And this stacks properly and multiplicatively with a more mundane cooldown like Rampart, as increasing the time between attacks by 20%, and reducing the damage by those same attacks means you reduce the amount of hits you take by 16.67%, and then reduce the damage of the attacks that come in by 20%, which is multiplicative, leading you to take around one third less damage when combined. Before we move on, I also just want to mention that tanks nowadays also have defensive cooldowns that are sort of like nested defensive cooldowns in the form of things like Holy Sheltron, which applies two 15% damage reduction effects simultaneously. These effects are separate, so they stack multiplicatively as well, which leads to absolutely wonderfully pretty calculations such as having a defensive cooldown on hand that actually reduces damage taken by 27.75% and not 30%. And with that, let's start to explore adjacent subjects. The first one is defensive cooldowns in relation to barriers, HP increases and healing, which is connected in the context of Effective HP, or EHP. Let's start with a somewhat strange example. EHP is part of why we tend to use defensive cooldowns early in a large pool in dungeons. If you have full HP, let's say 100,000 HP, and you use Rampart, reducing the damage you take by 20%, then those 100,000 HP can take a total of 125,000 damage before you die, instead of just 100,000. This is, in essence, what effective HP is, calculating how much damage enemies could shove at you literally before you would die. If you instead save Rampart for a panic situation where you only have 20% HP left, 20,000, then Rampart would actually only let you survive 25,000 damage. Meaning Rampart is drastically less helpful, unless you receive healing of course. In a situation where you're taking sustained damage, you could argue that Rampart also inflates the value of heals you receive for its duration. The way we calculate EHP is by dividing your actual HP by the percent of damage you are currently taking. For example, with Rampart, 100,000 divided by 80% equates to 125,000. HP increasing effects are obviously the most literal way to increase your EHP, but if it is accompanied by an increase in healing received, it can typically also be translated to be equivalent to damage reduction. To take a particular example, Warrior's Thrill of Battle both increases HP 
and healing received by 20%, which is basically the same as extending your HP in such a way that damage you actually take is only worth 5 sixths of what they would actually do, making it equivalent to reducing damage by 16.67%. If this was combined with Rampart, it would, like we saw with Arm's Length, be equivalent to taking one third less damage, which translates to 150,000 EHP based on the previous example of 100,000 base HP. And finally, barriers. These are different in two ways. The first being that some of them can be flat amounts unrelated to your actual HP. The second being that barriers usually take the hit for you before actual HP takes damage, which sometimes allows you to bypass mechanics entirely, as some mechanics in the game fail to apply their secondary effects if they don't connect actual damage to the player. For this reason, it can be somewhat important to know that barriers also benefit from damage reduction effects in the exact same way your actual HP does. This means that barriers can be added straight to your base HP and included when calculating total EHP. However, sometimes it matters more how much EHP the actual barrier itself has. For example, if you're looking to see if the barrier will actually break, which is particularly significant for Dark Knights and somewhat significant for Sages. Let's take an example from a Dark Knight using TBN, the Blackest Knight, with 100,000 HP. TBN will add 25,000 to the EHP, leading to a total of 125,000. If we then also use Rampart, then we land at 156,250 EHP, with, as we saw earlier, 125,000 of those being your actual HP, and the remaining 31,250 being TBN. So, the question is whether whatever attack, or attacks, plural, that you are anticipating will actually do 31,250 before the damage reduction from Rampart. And this is actually the entire idea of EHP. If before you used any cooldowns, you knew that you were actively taking 10,000 damage per second from whatever you're fighting, then it can sometimes be easy to think of EHP instead of trying to calculate the reduced damage intake. If you know you're taking 10,000 damage per second, and you use Rampart and TBN, then you know that TBN will break after 4 seconds. That is true whether you observe that you have 31,250 HP on that barrier, or you observe that you have 25,000 on the barrier, and the 10,000 damage you were taking per second is now 8,000. Ultimately, it is an alternative way to think of damage intake that allows you to skip some calculations and rely on the information you already have unchanged. This also further relates barriers to being observable as indirect healing, as by taking 25,000 damage on a shield instead of on your actual HP, you have a situation of a penny saved is a penny earned. You didn't lose 25,000 HP, so you saved it, so you indirectly healed it. This can also lead to Dark Knights having deceptively more self-sustain than they actually do, but this isn't some sort of magic trick, I'm not about to pull a bunny out of a hat. Acknowledging this information simply might lead you to use TBN more often, but it doesn't make TBN any more powerful than it already is. One final thing to talk about before we move on is that while stacking defensive cooldowns has this diminishing returns effect, what really matters when stacking cooldowns is taking little enough damage, or alternatively having enough EHP that whatever attack you will take will not kill you. This is why you may sometimes hear about kitchen sink mechanics in contexts like savage raiding. Attacks that do so much damage that you need to use every single cooldown to survive it. To take an example, if an attack does 200,000 damage and you have 100,000 HP, then you could survive it by using both Sentinel, Rampart and Holy Sheltron. So doing any less than that would be kind of pointless because you would die anyway. For the second adjacent subject, we have damage increasing buffs. That is, of course, what we sometimes somewhat inaccurately refer to as simply raid buffs. As most buffs stack multiplicatively, I probably don't need to tell you that damage increasing buffs do so as well. To take an actual example of how damage buffs stack, Dragoon has both Lance Charge and Dragon Sight, which each increases the damage the Dragoon does by 10%. If they are used together, you first go, well, Lance Charge increases my damage by 
And then you take that number and go, oh right, Dragon Sight increases my damage by 10%. So if you were doing, I don't know, 10,000 DPS, then Lance Charge would increase that to 11,000. And then Dragon Sight would increase that to 12,100. Or, in other words, 110% times 110% equals 121%. This also gives rise to why we have this thing called two minute bursts, because raid buffs align at this time, which can lead to absurdly big damage boosts with how they all stack together. I have a separate video discussing this subject in more detail if you're interested, link in the description. And for the third adjacent subject, we finally get to additive buffs. These are exceedingly rare, but have some telltale signs of them, so you can often predict which ones they are. Typically, additive buffs will affect the probability of something happening. This means buffs that increase crit chance, direct hit chance, and parry chance, for some examples directly available to jobs. The resulting effect of this interaction is that a job with zero chance to direct hit, which is absolutely possible, will still gain value from a buff like Barb's Battle Voice, which increases your direct hit chance by 20%. Note, an additive 20%. The only way to know this for sure is by testing it yourself, as the tooltip itself is not very good at tipping its hand that it is additive. But what this means is that a player with 0% direct hit chance benefiting from Battle Voice will go up to 20% Direct Hit Chance, while a player with 30% Direct Hit Chance will go up to 50%. Similarly, a player with 25% Crit Chance would go up to 35% Crit Chance while affected by a Dragoon's Battle Litany. And finally, as the base chance to parry is 10%, a Gunbreaker with Camouflage up would actually have a 60% chance to parry. Which actually means, assuming the base 10% chance to parry 15% damage as a given, a built-in 1.5% damage reduction, that Camouflage reduces damage taken by about 16.85% against physical attacks. An interesting interaction of Direct Hit and Crit Chance increases being additive is that having more Direct Hit indirectly makes Direct Hit boosting rate buffs less impactful. Not by much, but it is there. On the other hand, because Critical Hit, the stat, increases both the chance and power of crits, they don't have this weird negative synergy. I hope this overview of how buffs stack together was helpful, and if you have some examples of more complicated buffs that you require help with understanding how they work together, I would love to hear about it in the comments, and maybe we can figure these things out together. Now, that is all for this video, thank you so much for watching. If you would like to support me and my channel more directly, you can become a member like these wonderful people here. You can also alternatively support me through Ko-Fi, link in the description. You can also support the channel by letting the YouTube algorithm know by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, sharing, and hitting the bell to get notified when next I post a video. Fun fact, all directed chance you have, from stats or buffs, appear to be added additively as extra bonus damage to your actual direct hit on attacks that are guaranteed to direct hit. Guaranteed critical hits instead only have this interaction for crit chance gained from buffs, and your crit chance from your stats are not included.